Tonight we want to talk about the woman who dared to believe, and we turn to Joshua chapter 2. I want to talk tonight about Rahab the harlot, Joshua chapter 2. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in here tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men who are come to thee, who are entered into thine house, for they have come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, but I know not from where they were. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I know not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to the Jordan under the fords, and as soon as they who pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof, and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers have returned, and afterward may ye go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window by which thou didst let us down. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be free of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, according unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. Now, you all know the story of how Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. It's found in chapter 6. We'll not walk around the walls with them, but um, Joshua gives some orders now. Uh, verse 16 of Joshua 6, And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and the city shall be a curse. That means devoted unto God, all the booty, all the loot, even it and all that are in it to the Lord. 
Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in every way keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. Well, they did shout, and lo and behold, the walls came down. And verse 21, they utterly destroyed all that was in the city with the edge of the sword. And verse 22, Joshua says to the man, go into the harlot's house and bring out from there the woman and all that she hath as ye swore unto her. And the young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they left, and they brought out all her kindred and left them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and all that was in it. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab. Now, if you'll just keep in mind that the Old Testament name Joshua is the same as the New Testament name Jesus, you can put right in there, and Jesus saved Rahab. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now, when you think of the city of Jericho, you think of two people, obviously, Joshua and Rahab. We don't know the names of any other people in the city except Rahab. Rahab was a harlot. She apparently had a house on the wall somewhere near the city gate. She ran an inn, and along with the inn, she uh, occupied herself with her sin. Strange thing is that Rahab is mentioned three times in the New Testament. There are not many Old Testament women who are mentioned that many times in the New Testament. She's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Would you believe she's named in the genealogy of Jesus? Now, if you were working out your family tree, I don't know if you'd list all the prostitutes that were in the family. I stopped in a bookstore the other day. It's one of my weaknesses. And there was a book on how to trace your family tree. I said, I hope no one ever gives me one of those. I don't have the least desire to trace my family tree. What are you, you don't know what you're going to find. You may have a bunch of horse thieves. You don't know. And yet here she is in Matthew chapter 1, listed in the genealogy of Jesus. And then she's named in Hebrews 11. Not many women named in Hebrews 11. Great men of faith, but she's one of the great women of faith. By faith, Rahab. And then she's named in James chapter 2. When James was penning that important letter on how to live the Christian life, he was looking for a couple of illustrations of what it's all about. And he reached back and got Abraham, but everybody uses Abraham. The Holy Spirit said, hey, what about Rahab? Good choice. And so here is Rahab, the prostitute, listed three times, named three times in the New Testament. Now, I wonder why. You ponder over this. What is the one main lesson that you get from the life of Rahab? I think it's this. Rahab is to us a tremendous illustration of saving faith. Not just faith. Saving faith. If you want to learn about saving faith, Go talk to Rahab. Now, in the life of Rahab, we're going to discover four basic lessons about saving faith. And I can't think of anything that could better occupy our sanctified thinking this evening. Four basic lessons on saving faith. Lesson number one, the importance of of saving faith. Is saving faith important? It was certainly important to Rahab. One word shows how important saving faith is. You know what that one word is? Condemnation. Rahab was living in a city that was condemned. Keep a marker in the book of Joshua and just turn back to Deuteronomy just the previous book, Moses is uh, telling the Jewish nation what to do when they get in 
the promised land. And um, he doesn't suggest that they have a welcome wagon. He suggests that they wipe out the inhabitants of the land. Now, you will remember that God had a policy of declaring peace. If a city accepted peace, they would grant peace, and those people would become slaves. But God told them, don't you, don't you follow what they do at the altar? Don't you believe their religion? You burn their images? But there were some cities that had been devoted to destruction, and Jericho was one of them. Deuteronomy chapter 7 Moses says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land where thou goest to possess it, and hast cast out many nations before thee, and he names them, when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. But thus shall ye deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their idols, and bur burn their carved images with fire. Verse 23, But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction, until they be destroyed. Deuteronomy chapter 12, and we could look at many verses. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 1. These are the statutes and the ordinances. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods. Upon the high mountains, upon the hills, under every green tree, ye shall overthrow their altars, break down their pillars, burn their idols. And he repeats the same thing. Now, not only was there to be a religious house cleaning, but we notice in Joshua chapter 6, verse 21, that they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. Rahab was living in a city that was under condemnation. Oh, you say, what kind of a God is that? My, oh my, what kind of a God do you Christians worship that he would cause armies to come in and wipe these people out? Doesn't he have any patience? God had been patient for 440 years and two weeks. You figure it out. Back in Genesis chapter 15, when God told Abraham what was going to happen, he says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, and he gave them 400 years. Then, 40 years before, Israel had come out of Egypt. And news traveled in those days. They didn't have Walter Cronkite and Walter Jacobson and all these people, but news traveled. And when the Red Sea opened up, and when the Jewish people went through, and when they began to defeat the various armies, boy, the couriers came running, and news got into Jericho. All the bulletin boards had posters on them. The Jewish nation is coming. The Israelites are coming. They had 40 years to repent. And then the nation showed up there at the banks of the Jordan River, and they celebrated Passover. That took a week, a few extra days for some other things they did. Then they crossed over, you remember, and they marched around for a week. Don't you ever come and say God doesn't give people a chance? What can you do with 440 years and two weeks? And they watched him marching around and watched them marching around. She was living in a condemned city. Now, I've got news for you. You're living in a condemned city. The condemnation of God is over the city of Chicago just as much as it was over the city of Jericho. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And I say to you, my friend, the sword of God's judgment is over the sinners in Chicago 
just as much as it was over the pagan sinners in Jericho. Whether they feel like it or not. I've had people say to me, I don't feel condemned. Nowhere does God say you have to feel condemned. He says you are condemned. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? No. Then you're under condemnation. It just hasn't fallen yet. The sentence of God's condemnation had been passed years before, but the sentence had not been executed yet. And I want you to know that there are people walking the streets of Chicago, as there were people walking the streets of Jericho, who felt secure. Oh, when the news first came, they got upset. Even Rahab said, all of our hearts melted. We've lost our courage. But there were people in Jericho who were saying, well, it can't happen here. I mean, look at those walls, two huge sets of walls. What can those people do? And there are people, perhaps in this service tonight, who are saying, well, it can't happen to me. I mean, somehow I'll get saved before I die. How do you know? The first lesson Rahab teaches us is the importance of saving faith. Either you exercise saving faith or you die. It was either believe or burn. Now, the second lesson Rahab teaches us is the nature of saving faith. What is saving faith like? This is the greatest confusion in the world today. Satan is the master confuser, and he's got people confused about what saving faith is. I've talked to people who have faith in their faith. You know, just believe, I believe, I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I'm glad that isn't true. We'd be up to our armpits and flowers. People just believe. Oh, what do you believe? Well, I just believe. Boy, if you believe, you'll make it. Believe in what? There are people who have faith in tradition, faith in religion. Jericho had religion, lots of religion. God warned the Jews about the religion of Jericho. What is saving faith? Now, if you'll look at Joshua chapter 2, and if you'll focus on verses 10, 11, 12, you'll find out what saving faith is. What is the nature of saving faith? Is it easy believism? No. Is it mental assent? No. What is saving faith? Saving faith involves the whole person, your mind, your emotions, your will. Look at it. Verse 10, we have heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have heard. We heard what? We have heard what the Lord did how he opened up the sea, how he defeated the other nations. We have heard. Now, there are certain things you have to hear if you're going to be saved. Number one, that all have sinned, that there's not a righteous man or woman on the face of the earth. There are certain things you have to hear if you're going to be saved, that unless you do something about sin, you're lost forever. Remember the smart aleck who walked up to the, to the evangelist and said, what must I do to be lost? Because the man had preached on what must I do to be saved. And the preacher turned and said, nothing. We have heard, we have heard that there is a God who judges sin. We have heard that unless we believe, we shall be judged. We have heard that we are under condemnation. We have heard that we can do nothing about it ourselves. That's where saving faith begins, with the mind. You hear. You don't just believe anything you want to believe. You believe what the Word of God has to say. Now, what begins in the mind in verse 10 moves down to the heart in verse 11. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt within us. There was a stirring, a moving in the heart. There was a fear in the heart. Occasionally, I meet someone who says it's not right to use fear as a motive for salvation. That is foolish shallow, infantile, kindergarten thinking. John the Baptist used fear as a motive for salvation. You had better flee from the wrath to come. Jesus used fear as a motive for salvation. 
Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Paul used fear as a motive for salvation. He went to preach to the university crowd in Athens, to the intelligentsia, to the people who read the great book, who wrote the great books of the Western world. And what did he say to them? God has appointed a day in the which he will judge men by that man that he has ordained. And he's proved it by raising him from the dead. He dared to preach hellfire before the Greek philosophers. If you come up to me after the service and say, Pastor, I don't believe that fear is a good motive for salvation. Just go with me down to the hospital. Why are people in the hospitals today? Because they love it. Because the food is so good. Because it's so marvelous to lie there and be stuck with pins and be... No, no. You know why they're there? They're afraid. And rightly so. Here's a woman who wakes up and she has a pain in her side. Here's a man who wakes up and he's got a terrible pain. And he goes to the doctor and they x-ray and they test. And the doctor says, you have got a tumor. And there's fear. And that fear motivates him, motivates her, to go and do something about it. Do we blame them for this? Why no? We visit them and say, you know, it's the smartest thing you ever did to have those x-rays and go to the hospital. Here's a man driving his truck down the highway, and suddenly he can't control the truck. There, there's, there's, there's a looseness in, in, in the wheel. And so he pulls over to the nearest garage. Why? He's afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of causing and being in an accident. You say, why? Well, that's a very poor motive for parking your you know what's wrong with people today? People have a practical way of living, but when they come to religious things, they become very impractical. Rahab said, I'm afraid. I'm afraid for my mother and my father and my sisters and my brothers. I'm afraid. What is the nature of saving faith? It begins with the mind. We've heard. It moves into the heart. We fear. But you don't stop there. I've talked to many of people who have got the facts up in their head and the feelings down in their heart. That's as far as they've gotten. That's as far as that. You say to them, oh, do you believe in hell? Oh, I believe in hell. Have you done anything about it? No, I haven't. You see in verse uh, 12, now, therefore, 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 because I've heard the truth, therefore, because I feel the need, therefore, you do this. You see, she proved her faith by what she did. True saving faith moves into the will. You notice her confession of faith in verse 11? For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. That is the Old Testament equivalent of we believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here's her confession of faith. She didn't just think about it and didn't just feel about it. She acted upon it. She said, I will believe this God. That is saving faith. Did you ever stop to think of um, how difficult it was for uh, Rahab to believe like this? Nobody else in the city was believing like this. There are lots of people in Chicago who would get saved if their wife would get saved or their husband or their brother or sister or their best friend, make it easier. She'd never seen a, a gospel track. She'd never watched a TV. She'd never heard a sermon. But the word had gotten to her. Someone here tonight says, well, I can't be saved. It might cost me too much. She risked her life. She went to her mother and said, Mother, I have believed in the true God of Israel. I believed in the true God of heaven and earth. Her mother could have gone straight to the king and said, Kill my daughter. She's a traitor. But she won her mother and her father and her brothers and her sisters. Quietly, she was winning people to the true God of Israel. She was risking her life. There never was an easier place than a church service for a person to come and give his heart to Christ. And they won't do it. Never was an easier time than when there's been singing and praying and preaching. They won't do it. 
There never could be an easier country than America to stand up and say, I'm going to become a Christian. Being born again is the in thing these days. And people won't do it. Here's a woman, here's a sinner, a gross sinner, who in spite of the fact that she had to stand alone, exercise saving faith, which meant what? Her mind knew the facts. Her heart was controlled by the feelings. And then in a step of faith, she said, I believe I will receive the true God of Israel. Have you ever done that? Are you one-third saved? You got all the facts up here, but it's never changed you. You two-thirds saved, facts and feelings, or are you three-thirds saved? Totally, wholly given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. She teaches us the nature of saving faith. Now, thirdly, there's a third lesson. She teaches us the evidences of saving faith. How did these spies know for sure that she was saved? How did she know for sure that she was saved? She says up here in uh, verse 8, I know, I like that, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. Who told her that? Moses? She never met Moses. Read the Schofield notes, never saw the law. Who told her? Oh, the message had gotten through. What are the evidences of saving faith? I think here's the first one, assurance. Verse 9, I know when you're truly born again, there is an assurance in your heart and you can say, I know. There are many people who have the idea that if you say you know you're saved, you're arrogant, you're proud. The pious people say, well, I'm not really sure. I'll find out when I get there. Maybe too late. It is appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment. When a person truly exercises saving faith, there's an assurance in his heart. There's the witness of the Holy Spirit within that we're born of God. These things write I unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I know whom I have believed. Assurance. That's one of the first evidences of saving faith. You don't say, I hope so, I guess so, I wonder so. You say, I know so. The second evidence of saving faith, a changed life. This woman was changed. That's what James talks about, and we'd better read that. You better turn with me over here to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, because we have a lot of this going on today. James 2.14, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can that kind of faith save him? And the answer is no. That kind cannot save him. We are not, we are not saved by faith plus works. We are saved by a faith that works. If a brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Let's drop Rahab into verses 15 and 16. If some men come to you who represent the true God of Israel, and you say that you believe in the true God of Israel, but you don't side with them and risk your life with them, is that kind of faith going to save you? No. Faith without works is dead, being alone. A man may say, oh, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. How can you do that? How can you show someone your faith without works? Faith, true saving faith, changes the life. I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. That's what the Jews said. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is a one God. Thou doest well. The demons also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now he talks about Abraham. Abraham was justified by works. In what respect? Before men. When God said, Abraham, lay your son upon the altar, Abraham did it, thus proving he was truly 
a believer. Then he gets over to Rahab, verse 25. In like manner also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? She proved her faith by her works. That's another evidence of saving faith. There's a third evidence of saving faith, not only assurance in your heart and not only a changed life that results in works, but a witness, a desire to share it with others. Can you conceive of Rahab saying, hey, I'm saved, this whole town's going to hell, but I'm saved. Hallelujah, I'm saved. The rest of them are all going to be burned up and killed, but I'm saved. You can't conceive of a thing like that. I know professing Christians like that. Oh, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. What about your family? Well, I'm not worried about them. What about your neighbors? Oh, I'm not concerned. She was concerned. She said, if this thing works for me, it'll work for anybody. But, but Rahab, if you start witnessing, you are going to risk your life. I'll risk my life. I believe God can take care of me. And so she went to her mother and she won her mother. She said, Mother, you better be in this house on that seventh day or that'll be the end. And I tell you, when that seventh day came and Israel was marching around those seven times, Rahab was counting noses. They're here, they're here. You can prove that you're born again by a desire to share what you have with others. Do you know on some mission fields of the world they will not baptize a new Christian till he's won somebody else? That would decimate the ranks a little bit in America. It doesn't cost much to be baptized in America. It costs something on the mission field. The evidences of saving faith, assurance, works, witness. There's a fourth lesson that she teaches us, and this is the best lesson of all. She teaches us the lesson of the rewards of saving faith. Are there rewards to saving faith? There certainly are. First of all, she was delivered from judgment. I don't quite know how this happened. Some archaeologists will have to tell me, but they were in the house on the wall by the gate. I don't know if all the rest of the wall fell down and she that part stayed there. It's possible, probable. All I know is she was delivered from judgment. When things began to shake... She said, don't worry, folks, you're safe. Would you have wanted to be in her apartment when all of this was going on? Can you imagine maybe some of her nieces and nephews that are there? And they hear this shout, and they hear the trumpets blowing, and things begin to shake, and they get a hold of her. What's going to happen? She said, don't worry, don't worry. God's taking care of us. I tell you, things are shaking in this world. When things begin to shake, we don't worry about it. We say, that's all right. We know what's going to happen. We're all taken care of. God will take care of it. But not just the shaking, the burning. Because when those walls fell down and the army moved in, everybody was killed and the whole city was burned. I rejoice tonight that by the grace of God, there's no fire in my future. Now, the fire of God's holiness will test my works, 1 Corinthians 3. But I'll never taste the fire of the judgment of God. I'll never taste the fire of the wrath of God. While people are quibbling over, did Jesus really mean what he said? He meant it. Jesus had more to say about hell than he had to say about heaven. What are the rewards of saving faith? She was delivered from judgment. Only with her eyes did she behold and see the judgment on the wicked. Secondly, she had the joy of winning others. When the uh, scarlet thread was there, and that scarlet thread, oh, that reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't think we are stretching Scripture one millimeter when we say that that scarlet thread, that scarlet cord outside the window, reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ. What was it that saved her? The blood of the Savior. And Joshua saved Rahab. And Jesus saved Rahab. But she had the joy of winning others. When they came to get Rahab, she said, hey, got a whole house full of them. 
Here's my mother. Joshua, I want you to meet my father. Here's my niece. My Dear friend, that's going to be one of the great joys of heaven. Paul wrote to the Thessalonian Christians and said, What is our joy or our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord at his coming? I tell you, friend, heaven's going to be twice blessed when you can come to the Savior and say, look, thank you for, I won this one and I won that one. It's a great thing. One of the rewards of saving faith is helping to save other people. But the climax of the whole thing comes in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5, where lo and behold, Rahab the harlot. Lo and behold, Rahab the outsider. Lo and behold, Rahab the Gentile. Lo and behold, Rahab, the dog, marries into the people of Israel and becomes one of the ancestresses of the Lord Jesus. Matthew 1, 5, Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. And notice that Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. You've got Rahab and Ruth, two outsiders. The Ammonite and the Moabite shall not come into the congregation under the tenth generation. They're outsiders. Oh, but the, when the grace of God goes to work, God says, Rahab, not only are we going to save you from judgment, but Rahab, we're going to take you into the family. Now, this genealogy in Matthew ends with the birth of Christ, but ever since his birth, other people have been born into that family. Your name is in that genealogy. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, what's the reward of saving faith? You go to a wedding. There came a point in time when they came to Joshua and said, Hey, guess what? Rahab wants to get married and become one of us. Fine, take her in. And she marries into the family of God. I'm going to a wedding someday. I don't, I don't enjoy saying this. Believe me, it doesn't give my heart any joy to say this. But when many people will be facing fire... I'll be going to a wedding. Only by the grace of God, only by the goodness and mercy of God, we're going to a wedding. We're going to be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb because we're a part of his family. And all of this was by grace. Rahab, did you deserve this? Not on your life. How did you get saved? By grace, through faith. What kind of faith? Saving faith. Not just intellectual faith, no. Not just emotional faith, oh no. What kind of faith? Saving faith. Have you got that kind of faith? Most important question you can answer tonight is simply this. Have I exercised saving faith so that when the judgment comes, I don't have to worry? Or am I trusting my mother's religion or my father's religion or my good works or something else? Do I really have saving faith? Can I honestly look within my heart and say that the Spirit of God witnesses to my spirit that I'm a child of God? That's the most important question you can answer because the city of Chicago is under just as much condemnation, yea, more condemnation because we've had more light. We've had more opportunity. There's been more truth preached in this city than most of the cities of the world. And this city is under condemnation just as much as Jericho was, and that judgment is going to come. Some skeptic says, yeah, you've been saying that for years. Judgment's coming, judgment's coming. Hasn't come yet. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why the judgment hasn't come. Because God is long-suffering toward you unsaved people not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason Jesus didn't come last night is because there's somebody yet to be saved. The reason judgment hasn't fallen yet is because God patiently is waiting for you to give your heart to Christ, and you better do it. Rahab tells us what saving faith is all about, the importance of it, condemnation, the nature of it, the whole person. the rewards of it. Someday you're going to a wedding. My friend, the fire is coming. Do you have the evidences of it, of saving faith? Oh, if you don't know, if you aren't sure, I plead with you tonight, come and make sure 
that you've exercised saving faith in Jesus Christ and you know that you're saved. Let's bow together in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for the testimony of Rahab. Though she's dead, she still speaks. Thank you that out of her darkness and bondage came light and liberty. Thank you that in a city destined for destruction, she found salvation. Thank you that many have found salvation here in Chicago. I pray in Jesus' name, speak to the hearts of those here tonight who have never been saved or who are not sure of their salvation. Oh, Lord, may they come tonight and be saved by the grace of God. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.